Greetings, sisters and brothers. Welcome to African History Club, episode number five. I'm your host, Milton Alimadi. Just joining us for the first time. Welcome aboard as we continue on this journey, looking at different aspects of African history and looking at different regions to get a better understanding of the contemporary African condition and challenges and to explore further how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Today we focus on South Africa. We're going to take a different bit of focus today. We've been looking primarily at how Africa and African societies existed prior to the major contact with Europe. But in South Africa, the European engagement was relatively early. The rest of the continent was primarily conquered and colonized the last 20 years of the 19th century, primarily from 1880 to 1900. In the case of South Africa, the conquest started in the 17th century, in 1652, when the Dutch were the first to invade and occupy parts of what is today in the Cape province of South Africa, 1652. And the person who headed that first so-called settlement was named Jan van Riebeck, R-I-E-B-E-E-C-K. And at that time, the Dutch and the English were beginning to supersede the Portuguese as the primary sailing or marital powers of the day. And all of those countries primarily were looking for a trading route to the Far East, to China, to India, as well as to the Arabian Peninsula and as far as Indonesia. So the Dutch claimed that they wanted a resting station. <laughs> and that was the primary reason why they created a small settlement on the southernmost tip of the African continent. And the primary inhabitants of that region at the time was the Khoisan, K-H-O-I-S-A-N, Khoisan African people. They welcomed the Dutch. They sold them cattle for beef and sold them food. And this is something that we'll see being repeated later on when we start focusing on the colonization of other African regions, how the Africans welcomed the Europeans, and then how the Europeans turned on them. In the case of Khoisan, it's one of the sad stories of a people that was practically exterminated by the Dutch. So at some point it became obvious that the Dutch were not just looking for a resting station for their sailors going to the Far East and then resting on their way back to Holland. They could tell that the Dutch were not going anywhere when the numbers kept increasing. And eventually they also started rearing their own cattle and grazing on the same land that the Khoisan had been using for centuries. So the Khoisan confronted them. And the first battle was in 1659 between the Dutch invaders and the Khoisan. And the Dutch had built a fort by that time with walls surrounding their illegal settlements. That's what they were, illegal settlements. I want to read from what was recorded by one of the Dutch occupiers. This is what he wrote in terms of his notes or recollection of a meeting. After the Khoisan had fought several battles, they thought maybe wiser heads could prevail, and they sought a meeting to resolve the conflict. So this is the Dutch Dutch individual who wrote this. This is his impression of that meeting. They spoke for a long time 
referring to the Khoisan, about our taking every day for our own use more of the land which had belonged to them from all ages and on which they were accustomed to pasture their cattle. They also asked whether, if they were to come to Holland, they would be permitted to act in a similar manner, saying, quote, It would not matter if you stayed at the fort, but you come into the interior, selecting the best land for yourselves, and never once asking whether we like it, or whether it will put us to any inconvenience. End quote. They therefore insisted very strenuously that they should again be allowed free access to the pasture. Mind you, free access <laughs> to their land that belongs to them. Let me continue the reading. They objected that there was not enough grass for both their cattle and ours. Quote, are we not right, therefore, to prevent you from getting any more cattle? For if you get many cattle, you come and occupy our pasture with them, and then say the land is not wide enough for us both. Who then, with the greatest degree of justice, should give way? The natural owner? or the foreign invaders, end quote. They insisted so much on this point that we told them they had lost that land in war and therefore could not expect to get it back. It was ours, our intention to keep it. Yes, that was the ruthless arrogance of the guest who had been welcomed who had been fed <laughs> by the Khoisan. But what is unusual? This history has been repeated all over the world, including here in these United States, correct? So yeah, so we are taking another approach as South Africa today because of this early influx of Europe, 300 years before the rest of Africa was actually conquered and colonized. The Khoisan suffered an ignoble, brutal fate, conquered, practically exterminated by the Dutch, killed the children, captured and enslaved to work the farms, the land that used to belong to them, and to rear the cattle, plundered, from their parents and their communities. That is the history of the Khoisan. Many were recruited and forced into the army created by the Dutch and assisted them in attacking other Africans. Yes, indeed. And attacking other Khoisan communities as well. Some of the Khoisan survivors moved farther away from that region to survive and avoid being exterminated. And after they had dealt with the Khoisan, the Dutch then turned their attention to the other major nations, kingdoms in the region. And the Khoisan were next. The Khoisan were closer to them than any other nations or kingdoms in that part of South Africa. So they started attacking the Khoisan. Khoisan is spelled X-H-O-S-A. And that is also the ancestry of the late Nelson Madiba Mandela. The Khoisan had pretty much been exterminated by that time. But the Kosa gave the Dutch more than they could handle. The Dutch incurred heavy casualties. Occasionally they raided and plundered Khoisan 
plundered Corsa communities, went off with their cattle, raised their homes, killed, but the Corsa also mounted attacks, inflicting heavy casualties, killing the Dutch and repossessing the cattle that belonged to them. They fought pretty much for more than a century. The Corsa were resisting and the Zulu as well. And by this time, the British also entered the fray. The British also wanted to get a piece of the richness of the land and the resources of South Africa. So at this point, I should also note that the Zulu, and we'll get to their major battle with the British in a little bit, also had been prepared by one of the greatest generals and military strategists in all of history, and that was Shaka, who ruled between 1816 to 1828. And Shaka was, of course, became very famous for his military innovations. And one of them was the creation of a weapon called the Asegai, A-S-S-E-G-A-I. Typically, most of their battles had been fought with long shaft spears. But Shaka made one with a wide blade, but with a very short handle, and that allowed his soldiers to be able to prevail in closer hand-to-hand -hand combat and revolutionize warfare in that part of Africa and expanded his kingdom and trained very formidable forces. So that became part of the tradition of the Zulus. Shaka's full name was Shaka Shaka Kasen Zangakana. So I'll spell it for you. K-A-S-E-N-Z-A-N-G-A-K-H-O-N-A. -A -A. But more widely known just by Shaka, of course. And you've seen many of the feature films, sensationalized films, referred to as uh, Shaka. Shaka Zulu. So Shaka prepared the Zulu for the many battles that they were to fight later on. So yes, the Corsa were annihilated, were enslaved, were destroyed, but that was not the case for the Corsa or the Zulu and other nations in that part of Africa. The Dutch also imported enslaved Africans from other parts of Africa, from Guinea, from Angola, and from as far as Madagascar as well, as they kept stealing more land and needing to exploit the labor of others to profit uh, from the land. Of course, as you can expect, the British and the Dutch fought many battles in South Africa to get to see who would control resources that belonged to neither. <laughs> so they actually fought many bloody battles in order to see who would get to control what did not belong to them in South Africa. The British at one point gained control of that Cape colony in uh, 1795. And then it reverted back to the Dutch for a short while before the British gained control again in 1814. So you have Europeans fighting in Africa, killing 
fellow Europeans and killing Africans as well. The South Africans basically were not exterminated because they fought fiercely. They fought fiercely and that was the difference between their fate and the tragedy that befell uh, when we compare to Native Americans, you know, in this country. So let's look at some of the African victories in these wars of resistance that African fought against these invading Europeans. One was by King Sekukunai, and I'll spell Sekukunai for you. S-E-K-H-U, K-H-U-N-E, King Sekukune of the Marota. And he defeated the Dutch in 1876. The Dutch had set up what they call the Republic of Transvaal in South Africa. Sekukune also defeated the British on two occasions, in 1878 and in early 1879 before eventually he too was defeated. The most spectacular of the African victories, not only in South Africa, but for the entire African continent, was the Battle of Isandwala, and I'll spell that for you. I-S-L-A-N-D-W-A-L-A. And that was the great Zulu victory at Isandwala, when they killed 1,300 British soldiers in 1879. And the general, the Zulu general who led that battle is General Nshingwaya Koza, N-T-S-H-I-N-G-W-A-Y-A is his first name, Koza, K-H-O. Z A annihilated the entire brigade of 1300 British soldiers. It was a historic victory and the British had never suffered such a heavy defeat in Africa. Now the conflict between the British and the Dutch in South Africa fighting over resources that didn't belong to them, escalated at one point. Primarily, it had been focused on the land. But now it even became much more severe. This fight in a land that did not belong to them, when gold and diamond were discovered in South Africa, Diamonds first discovered in 1867 in Kimberley and gold in 1884 in the Transvaal and other regions of South Africa. So they fought two major wars called the Boer Wars. And Boer is spelled B-O-E-R. And that's how the Dutch were referred to in South Africa. The first of the two major wars was 1880 to 1881, and then 1899 to 1902. And in 1902, 18, 1899 to 1902 war, the second Boer War, the British adopted a scorched earth policy, annihilated anything and everything in front of them, destroyed the Dutch homes, the farms, the food crops, and then put civilians into concentration camps, where 30,000 of the Dutch perished. The figures vary. Some say 28,000. I've seen some figures 30,000 let's say tens of thousands. And out of that number, 22,000 were children. So you can research, you'll look at, and you can find some of the photographs, in fact, of some of the people, including the children who are in these camps. And the point here is if Europeans could do that to 
other Europeans. What were they doing to Africans? The rightful owners of the land and of the resources. Of course, the Dutch and the British made up when they made the decision that it is best that we unite so that we can effectively and efficiently exploit, colonize the Africans. So they came together in 1910 and created the Union of South Africa. They combined the colonies owned or controlled by the Dutch, controlled by the British, and formed the Union of South Africa and the African population. The Africans were disenfranchised from this Union of South Africa, which became the Republic of South Africa in 1961, and then commenced to start exploiting the labor of Africans to mine the gold and to mine the diamond. Extremely cheap labor, so cheap, so severe, that the ores were dug from the deepest pits, deepest mines, that ordinarily, under normal conditions, would not even be profitable. But since the Africans were paid slave wages, the Europeans made this a profitable enterprise. And the demeaning, horrific conditions under which Africans worked those mines, in the diamond mines, they were kept in hostels for six continuous months, typically, under the contracted, you could even call it the slave contracts, six continuous months living in barracks-like conditions and not being able to go anywhere and work them to the bone for six continuous months. And then when their time to leave in between these contracts, they were kept in isolation whenever each unit was due to leave, naked, in special rooms where they were only allowed blankets and no item of clothing. And they were given laxatives so that their stool could be examined over those couple of days to make sure they were not taking any of the diamonds that rightfully belonged to them anyway. So that was the humiliating, exploitative condition under which the Africans were made to build the wealth of South Africa that made Europeans in South Africa live with a living standard, the highest per capita, per capita living standard of Europeans anywhere in the world, even higher than here in the United States. Yes. That was South Africa. And then in 1948, apartheid became the official policy of South Africa. Official policy of racial segregation, discrimination, and exploitation. And apartheid lasted until Nelson Mandela was elected the first African president in 1994, but the struggle to liberate South Africa is going to be the subject of a future podcast. So we need not go into the details of that today. So on that note, we can actually now close this episode five of our podcast. Now, there are quite a few books 
but most of them are very Eurocentric. So I will not mention them. I'll only mention the books that don't take a Eurocentric tone or angle. So you can find books that even describe the Zulu War, for example. When the Zulu won at the Battle of Isandwala, most of the books written by Europeans about that battle would not outright give credit to the Zulus. It would always be a reference to some European officer making a mistake, not sending a message on time, or misreading instructions, and all the other nonsense, you know. <laughs> so that's why even when they're describing victory by Africans, it's still Eurocentric and still demeaning. So that is why there are a few books that I could recommend. So The General History of Africa, Volume 4, Africa from the 12th to the 16th century, which we referred to in our earlier podcast. The editor is Initial J. The last name is Key Zerbo, that's K-I hyphen Z-E-R B-O. And then, of course, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney, R-O-D-N-E-Y. And then Wither South Africa, W-H-I-T-H-E-R, Wither South Africa by Bernard Magubane, the late Bernard Magubane. He was a socialist, or Marxian economist, who was exiled from South Africa for many years during the apartheid era, and taught in a number of universities in the United States, and was very involved in the struggle to liberate South Africa, And before the end of his life, he did get to see a liberated South Africa and return to South Africa, a liberated South Africa, before he passed away. And his book is very good. He takes a very political economy analysis. We're still dealing more with the history now. So we will revisit his book. And actually, I will read some seg- sections from, uh, from the book that he wrote articles for and edited other articles by other writers in that same book. So in our next episode, we will visit the Great Lakes region, East and Central Africa. And then from there, we will go to North Africa. And then we will look at the ancient kingdoms of Africa, Egypt, Aksum, Nubia. And then we will look at the trade in enslaved Africans. And then finally, we will start looking at the era of European conquest African resistance, and European colonization. So thank you, especially to all of you who are visiting us on this podcast for the first time. Welcome to everybody. Stay strong, stay Pan-African, and see you next week. I'm your host, Milton Alimadi.